my name is Francisco Alberini, and I'm super excited here to be presenting at the uh, Airflow Summit. I'm going to be talking about uh, root cause analysis for your data pipelines. Uh, so you might be asking, what does that mean? Well, let's get into it. Uh, before we do, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a product manager here at Monte Carlo. I've been with the company for uh, about a year and a half. I joined in January of last year. Before that, I worked at a company called Segment. I was a product manager of our data quality tool called Protocols at the time. Uh, I'm the father of two boys. Uh, one is now just turning six months old. Uh, the other one's about two and a half. Uh, I'm also a gardener in training. I live in Brooklyn and have been taking up gardening for uh, the summer that's now uh, coming in. Excited to see if I grow anything. Cool. Uh, before we jump into root cause of data, um, you know, as I was reflecting on this presentation, I thought about, you know, root cause of crying babies. So it's something I've been thinking a lot about uh, with a six month old. Um, but I can tell you that trying to figure out why baby's crying it can be straightforward a lot of times maybe there's a there's a clear cause for it but a lot of times there's a long tail of things that i have no idea <clears throat> and what i found to be most effective is, is trying to think about a checklist like what how can i make sure that i'm going through in a sleep deprived state all the things that could be easily uh, detected as to the, the reason why or the root cause of why my baby is crying. Uh, and then think about, you know, long-term, what, what are the long tail things of reasons that, that that wouldn't be there? So a lot of times that means, is my baby's diaper dirty? Uh, is my baby cold? Maybe the baby's hot. Uh, maybe the baby's hungry and I, you know, missed the feeding by a couple of minutes and I need to make sure I get that bottle ready. And then of course, there's the long tail of things where, uh, it, you know, data becomes a little harder to find because it really is, I don't even know what to start asking beyond that, uh, which makes me think, uh, you know, you have good pipelines, bad data, something we talk a lot about here at Monte Carlo. Uh, I like to frame, frame that as good parents, bad data, but, uh, you know, we'll see, we'll see if that sticks. Anyways, uh, let's move on to some of the uh, the real uh, exciting content here after that uh, brief diversion. Um, so the perhaps one of the most obvious statements uh, of this decade uh, is that everyone in companies is relying on data more and more to do their jobs. Uh, this is a grand vision that I think we've heard from almost every company and have seen some companies do extraordinarily well, uh, using data to be more effective, make better decisions. Uh, the reality though, it's hard. It's uh, really hard. I was just talking to one of our uh, champions at one of our companies and he said to me those exact words. He basically said, you know, we had this grand vision of data becoming the thing that powers all of our companies. But when push comes to shove, the, the quality of that data makes everyone feel really unsure. Like, can I really make this decision? Because we've seen far too many times data go wrong or have issues or, you know, the, the quality of that data be off. And then if you're doing something like reporting numbers to Wall Street, like you, you can't have these questions of, of whether or not the quality of the data is there. Um, so this is just something kind of level setting the, the importance of getting data right. Uh, and that's something that we at Monte Carlo spend a lot of our time doing uh, as we build out a data observability platform. Uh, so the reality is, what, what do we do about this? You know, especially when a downstream consumer says, hey, there's something wrong with this data. What's going on? Uh, and you can just say, I don't know, usually is the situation. I wasn't even aware of that, which is really a tough thing to say, I think, especially as a data engineering team. We work a lot with data engineers. The last thing you want to do is say, I don't know. I'm not even aware of that issue. Um, but it happens far too often. Uh, so let's continue on here. Uh, and, and, and I think a way to frame that is called data downtime. Uh, that's something that, that we, how we frame it, how we talk about it internally. And it's just any time that data is partial, erroneous, uh, maybe missing, uh, maybe, maybe missed the last update, or it's just generally inaccurate. And there's so many reasons why that data can be wrong, or that so many reasons why this data downtime occurs. Uh, and a lot of times as we think about uh, some analogous work with uh, SRE or DevOps, we'll get more into that later. Uh, but this is something that that like in a DevOps world, it's like, okay, the microservice is broken or there's an operational issue, there's something wrong with the code. Uh, but within data, there's this like exponential number of other things that could be happening, which makes this a real serious problem. 
So as we get into uh, the, the rest of the presentation, we'll really be focused here on just the root cause piece. Uh, we can talk about incident detection. There's a lot of work being done there, uh, in, us included, and then a lot of other folks in the, in the space, even just writing simple tests uh, can be something that a lot of customers are doing. Uh, but this is more about root cause. And, and the reason why I think this is really important. Um, you know, we talked to a lot of customers and um, we've had many customers tell us, listen, I, I don't need much help with the root cause. I've been working here for three years. I know the entire data pipeline on the back, like the back of my hand. And it's, you know, and not that they're, you know, being full of themselves, they actually really understand the ends and outs how the data works. So if I tell them, hey, there's an issue here in this particular table, they can be like, yep, I know exactly what's happening. It's this, you know, three levels upstream in the lineage as an airflow DAG that runs a Spark job. And I think that Spark job might be failing. So I'm going to go and check, you know, what particular thing is happening with, with that Spark job. Um, but this doesn't really work as teams grow, especially now as teams are investing more and more in growing out their data functions. New data engineers don't have that context. There's no way that someone who just joined a month ago would have the context of knowing, oh yeah, I know this, that's three levels upstream and it's a particular DAC. No, this is not going to happen. Um, so what we found to be really effective is having a clear process in place, something that can scale uh, and help anyone, regardless of their intimate knowledge with a particular pipeline, know what to do in these scenarios when they actually see or catch an issue. Uh, and and the, the nice thing for us, at least, is that there's a whole world out there in the DevOps world, in site reliability engineering, uh, uh, of processes, of things that really work, of, of uh, concepts and frameworks that work really well for helping uh, to deploy highly scalable, highly resilient microservices and applications. Uh, and a lot of that can be pulled into the data world. We can learn a lot from this. And this is something that we've seen work really well with a lot of our customers as well, uh, seeing a lot of uptake in, in these concepts and frameworks. And what are those concepts? Things like source control. I thought it's probably obvious. I'm sure any data engineer in the room is using some kind of version control or source control. Uh, things like anomaly detection. There's a lot of frameworks out there for this. We spend a lot of our time thinking about this and, and actually that's part of one of the key factors of uh, success for us here at Monte Carlo. Uh, severity, having a severity model. This one's tricky. I think I, we've worked with a lot of customers to try and figure out, well, what is a high severity uh, incident versus a low severity? Usually it's some kind of combination of the type of problem that exists. Is it a data issue? Is it that the data was not there when it should have been? Did it cause some ripple effect downstream? And then also who's consuming that data? So like if there's a thousand downstream dashboards that are feeding off this data, but data or this particular table, but no one's looked at them in a year, probably not a very high severity issue. It might seem at face value that it is, but if you dig deeper, you're like, actually, there's no one even looking at this versus, hey, this particular uh, data is going to be used to report to Wall Street tomorrow. We, that that is a it code red Sev zero, you know, everyone stop what you're doing. This needs to be fixed immediately. There are testing frameworks. Uh, there's a lot of work being done here in the data of the world, uh, CICD, uh, even measurement. Uh, this is another one that is new oftentimes to some of the, the data folks that I speak to or data engineering folks, but things like service level indicators and service level objectives, and service level agreements, all of that framework for how do we determine the uptime of a particular system squeezing that into the data world is a little tricky, but uh, but these are things that that work really well, and there are there are ways to to apply these to to data. Uh, and in terms of root cause, there are two things that we look for when uh, thinking about or, or learning from the DevOps and SRE world. Um, the first is code. Uh, so any type of code based issue, I deployed some new code, I merged it in, deployed it to production. There's an actual issue that was caused as a result of that. Uh, and the second one is the operational environment. So it's like, is there something happening with a particular um, you know, server that might be running out of memory and therefore we need to go and actually check? Uh, so understanding how to operationally look for these two different things and say, look, like, I'm going to check the code. Was there, you know, any, were there any code changes that occurred recently that might be have caused this particular issue? And then I want to go check my, my logs and I want to check... You know, all the different systems to see what might be happening within the, the operational environment world. Uh, and these are two concepts, again, that can be applied to data. Uh, and I, I think another thing here that that is to me really interesting about uh, 
from the DevOps SRE world is, is over the last, let's say 20 years, there's been this push to, to modularize and to create these kind of contained environments where each team can operate and deploy their microservices. And all of the interaction that happens across these different teams is done via APIs. So that kind of creates this blast radius, kind of like a containment zone where if something happens in a, one particular team's operational environment, let's say, it's not like the whole app is going down. There's a lot of redundancy built into uh, these particular systems. Uh, and I think that's created uh, just an amazing ability to allow teams to run very quickly, to deploy code, to ship features, knowing that there is kind of like a, a break point where they're not gonna cause catastrophic failure across the organization. Um, and when we add data though, things start to get a little messy. Uh, and part of the reason, the obvious reason here is that they're, Data warehouses are usually centralized resources. They're things that many teams interact with uh, and can interact with. So yes, we have schemas, we have different uh, mechanisms to create organizational models of who can touch what and who can interact with what. Uh, but teams are reading from each other's schemas oftentimes, they're writing to, uh, they're creating a lot of complexity here. And while I wish the world looks like I do in this diagram here, you have, you know, team on the left interacting with schema one, team in the middle interacting with schemas two and three, and then team on the right interacting with schema four. That is rarely reality. Oftentimes you'll see all these, you know, almost like uh, kind of subterranean uh, uh, processes that are pulling data across schemas. And many times people aren't even aware, like, oh, I had no idea. I don't know what that is. You know, there was one customer that I talked to a lot um, and she was mentioning, it's like, yeah, we have this one schema that belongs to one of the first data engineers that worked here. Uh, and I can tell you that there are things happening in that schema that I assure you are very important. Like if I go and delete that schema, things are going to break and it's going to be pretty painful. Uh, but that person no longer works here. So now I have to figure out what is happening. Like what is happening in this, per this person's uh, own schema to, to, to then understand how do I even make changes? How do I improve the quality of data over time? And that complexity is really quite unique. It's something that, that really, it's been figured out in the DevOps SRE world and something that I think we're figuring out in the data world. Um, but that's not where it ends. We also have analytics teams now uh, being able to get their hands dirty with the data itself as well. Plenty of tools and solutions out there, things like DBT, which allow analytics folks to actually write SQL that make permanent changes to data within a warehouse. And that's an incredible boon for productivity. It gives them so much power, analytics folks, power to actually run and deploy models and analyze things faster. It's a huge, huge win, but it also comes with a cost in that now we have yet another source of change that's happening within this data environment uh, with very little ability to create these containment zones like we have on the microservices side. And then we have downstream, our BI uh, folks, you know, there, there's, there's concepts like LookML where we're seeing these models that are being built within the actual uh, BI layer, which adds some more complexity to this problem. It's like, well, how is that model interacting with the tables upstream in the warehouse? Um, and an understanding context of who is actually looking at those reports. Uh, there's kind of this, this, this uh, wall in between the warehouse and then the downstream BI layer where it's very difficult to understand the context of like, okay, this particular table is broken, who downstream is looking at that? This is something similar that we spend a lot of time in Monte Carlo looking to solve with our lineage product. So uh, we talk about an incident before we saw one where it was contained, great. One team has an operational environment issue. We think, oh, it's only affecting schema four. No, that's impacting the entire warehouse just because of the fact that, or likely could be impacting the entire warehouse and therefore every single team uh, within the company just because of the way that these kind of tentacles of the warehouse start to interact across these different teams. So that means that we now need to add to our root cause model a whole different category, which is what we call data, the data category. So when we have data, code, and operational environment. Um, and going back to my checklist uh, for uh, how to address or determine the root cause of a crying baby, these are the three categories that we look for for determining the root cause of a data issue. And we'll jump into now exactly how, what things are that you can do within each of these categories. 
before I jump though, there's, there's one note that I, I want to talk about. There's a amazing article on locally optimistic by Brian Ofoot, who talks about that, that complexity of, of why data systems tend to be slightly different than, and, and more complex, uh, more prone to issues than um, some of the microservices world. Uh, and I recommend that read. It's just a, it's a fantastic article um, to get a real sense of, of why data is different. Uh, what do we do about it? Could always try harder. Uh, that tends to rarely work. Uh, so let's let's go dig in into you know determining root cause here. Uh, before we do, let's talk about an example. I think it's really helpful to ground. Uh, these are examples that we hear from our customers all the time. I mean, I see them in our own Slack channels. I'm sure if you're on a data engineering team, you have some analytics Slack channel that uh, is uh, where people are asking questions like Patricia's here. Uh, you know, I'm about to make a big business decision. Something looks off with this clean issuances table. Uh, and then we can see here, this is an incident within Monte Carlo, but oh yeah, there was actually a big spike in volume there. A bunch of records maybe were added manually. Maybe it was a part of some you know, new uh, where clause filtering, which increased the number of records. Uh, and then there's some odd periods there of, of no change, which is abnormal for, uh, for that particular table. Uh, so we can start by looking at the data. Let's actually take a closer look. Uh, something that we, we support, but is also completely doable with just simple queries is to figure out, well, within the records uh, that we're seeing that volume issue, is there anything interesting about them? Perhaps the percent null of those records is going up. Oh, interesting. Okay, so there's something weird here that the, you know there is an actual issue that, that Patricia found. Um, in this case, historical value for nulls is 0%. Now we're seeing around 5% nulls. Now we have 5% of our records have missing perhaps a very critical piece of information here. In this case, the account name, likely used in joins or in different mechanisms. Um, the second one is to actually look for correlations between those rows, right? Those extra rows and whether there's any field values that correlate. So we talked about there's a big bump increase in volume and records in a particular table. Do any of the fields have values that correlate to that bump and saying like, or abnormally correlate? So we have in this case, Twitter being one of the main sources like that of that null rate or of that, that bump in records. That helps us realize, okay, it's actually probably some ETL that's happening many, many layers upstream, but likely coming from Twitter. Could also just be a business change, right? Maybe actually there was a Twitter campaign that we ran, put a bunch of money into it that drove the increase in volume. Likely doesn't account for the percent nulls, but that could be also uh, part of the cause there. Uh, and then looking at lineage. So lineage is something that uh, can be calculated. A lot of tools support this. Airflow certainly does. Uh, and what, uh, what we can look there is to try and understand upstream, were there any changes that occurred uh, with the data or there are any incidents that are happening upstream? So I can say in this case, oh, I see the users accounts and warehouse table upstream here. Those are external tables likely being populated by some airflow jobs uh, that are having some issues as well. So I get a sense, okay, you know, this particular table that I'm looking at has issues, but it's, it's likely a, a, a root cause is, is further upstream and that helps pin pinpoint and narrow your investigation. So a quick recap there uh, for the data components. First, profiling your anomalous records. So actually taking a look at those records. Is there anything unique about them in terms of percent nulls and uniqueness and all these different metrics that you can, can really run fairly easily with some SQL queries? Uh, evaluating the field values for anomalous records, so doing some bit of correlate, correlation analysis. Uh, is there anything unique or interesting in the values of those particular records for these, these anomalous records? And then of course, looking upstream at your lineage. Are there things upstream tables upstream that are similarly encountering issues that help us then narrow your focus to, to where that breakpoint is actually occurring. Awesome. So let's jump into code. So we've talked about data and now we'll talk about uh, your code root cause or how you can determine root cause with, with looking at code. Uh, the first is to look at the query details. So like for a particular table, how what are the queries that are being run to populate that data? Could be a DBD job, could be something that you're importing from uh, a, you know, an airflow task. Uh, there's lots of different things. It could be just something that someone's running in-house for uh, within the warehouse itself. 
Um, but looking at that gives you a clue as to how is this table being populated? Where is the data coming from? And can be super powerful, especially if there are changes. This is something that even we've caught internally uh, where uh, someone had a particular SQL model that they were creating and accidentally pushed to production uh, the addition of a limit 500 to that query. And then that caused, of course, the volume in this table, this destination table to drop to 500. And if you're looking at this, you're saying, oh my gosh, what's happening? Why, why did we lose you know, the you know, 150,000 records and now we have 500? Um, just being able to very quickly pinpoint and say, oh, actually the query changed right as this was happening. There was like, there used to be run as, you know, this, and now it, we added, you know, 15 new characters, which is a limit 500. And all of a sudden the whole uh, table is broken. Um, this is one thing that we do in Monte Carlo, but you can see here the Y axis of this table is actually showing the number of characters in the query. So a very easy way to visually see did this query change? Oh, yes, the number of characters changed. Very likely that the query changed. Uh, this is a simple heuristic that we've we've found to be quite effective in, in helping you quickly, you know, narrow down. Okay, actually, the query didn't change. Great. Can can leave that out of my analysis and keep moving to, to determine the root cause. Awesome. So, a quick recap there of the code. Looking at the code itself. SQL, Python, you know, you can actually go look at your Airflow uh, DAG, understand what is happening, how is the code running, uh, and then looking at specifically within a warehouse, are queries changing? Is a SQL query changing? And lastly, we'll touch on the operational environment. Um, so, of course, this is probably the, the most uh, common and something that you all are familiar with, especially as Airflow uh, users. Um, but understanding, are there any errors in the logs? Being able to look through your Airflow logs, are there, there are obvious errors that are potentially causing this? Perhaps there are permission changes within the warehouse, you know, network changes, uh, scheduling changes. Maybe a particular DAG was expected to run at X time, but daylight savings happened and now we're an hour off and that caused this ripple effect downstream. Um, and then performance hits, you know, maybe the, the, the performance of the queries, maybe the performance of the Spark jobs that are running are not uh, meeting the, the expectation and that's what's causing this, this uh, kind of uh, ripple effect downstream. Um, secondly, leveraging your peers. Uh, so I think I touched on this earlier, but this idea of like oftentimes companies have you know, small data engineering teams of people that really understand the pipelines uh, like the back of their hand. Maybe you're a new person on the team, you're trying to figure out. The reality is like documentation can be really, really helpful here. Saying, oh yeah, of course, I can actually see there was a there was an issue like this three weeks ago. All that required was resetting, uh, you know, a particular task and everything seemed to work itself out. That would be super helpful to know. Um, and the only way to know that though is to have really strong documentation. So it requires a bit of an investment on everyone uh, to be able to actually drive this and, and, and use a documented kind of centralized place for, for capturing what happened, what was done to determine, the, to, to actually resolve the issue. Um, and then another one here, this is uh, uh, more a bit of like going to the, the DevOps world, but actually setting some really basic SLAs, SLOs and SLIs um, can be super helpful because it just helps the team understand, are we doing the right things? Are we kind of like engaging in the right behaviors to actually improve the quality of, data of, over the quality of our data over time? Uh, this becomes something that I've seen like some teams really start to, to, to uh, enact and, and enable within the organizations. And the beauty is that they can also now communicate this upstream. So it's when they're saying, okay, you know, we want to, and I actually had a customer do this recently. She was like, hey, I, I want to increase the size of our team. I need more resources, but I just need like data to prove that this is super complicated and that we're actually making progress. And that if you invest X, you know, number of headcount or in separate tools, that it will allow us to drive this number up, which is what we all want. That's the kind of like... The, the currency of how we get uh, resources in companies is to show data about it. Great. Uh, and then another really helpful metric here that we've seen is uh, that we've seen work well is the uh, what we call the data downtime metric. Uh, it's really simple. It's just the number of incidents that you have, let's say in a particular month, um, how long it took you to detect those incidents and how long it took you to resolve. With root cause, you have a very click, a quick and clear mechanism for root cause, your time to resolution, you can bring that down really quickly. Uh, time to detection is usually trickier. That's the type of thing that uh, you know can usually take weeks if you don't have testing in place or if you don't have an anomaly detection solution in place. 
Um, but these tools out there, Monte Carlo being one of them, there's plenty of tools that do this. Um, the tools are making that time to detection go down significantly, uh, which can be huge. You know, now you can take this data downtime from months to weeks to hours, you know, and even minutes in some cases, uh, and be in and really show that progression. All right. And one quick recap data of our root cause of analysis, starting with data, uh, profile your anomalous records, evaluate the field values uh, among those anomalous records for patterns, look for upstream issues. If you have a lineage solution, make sure that you're, you're looking upstream and trying to pinpoint, narrow your focus of your, of your root cause. As we move into the code piece, so looking at the code itself, it's the SQL, Python, et cetera. Uh, and then, of course, looking at, the, at uh, the, the SQL queries and trying to understand, are there changes to the SQL queries being run on this particular table, which could be causing the actual issue. Then we move into the operational environment. Let's say that we've, we've narrowed it down. All, everything on the data looks good. Everything on the code looks good. What about the operational environment? Are there any error logs or issues, network permission issues, uh, performance issues in the system? Um, documenting those post-mortems post can be incredibly helpful. It helps uh, very quickly the next person resolve the issue. And then these metrics, I think this is something that uh, these, these metrics that the DevOps SRE world use very, very frequently, they can be applied to data. Uh, we're seeing a lot of excitement around that. Uh, bring it all together. Uh, this is uh, the Monte Carlo view. We call this incident IQ. This is where we're bringing all those different components together, making it easy to set severity, to assign uh, different incidents, to actually understand what is the root cause of that incident uh, and, and dive into the specifics there. Uh, great. So we're almost done. Uh, just a few key takeaways. Uh, modern da data pipelines are super messy. Uh, and that's actually a good thing. You know, it's like what I mentioned before, we're enabling teams to actually uh, do things with data that they could never do before. Uh, and we have to think about now how to create systems to can, to make sure that, that that's done being, that's all being done safely in a way that enables teams to move fast. Um, root cause analysis gives us these tools to eliminate this. So, you know, if we're able to very quickly determine the root cause of an incident, we're able to quickly resolve those incidents, which means that we can go on to building new, more complex pipelines uh, and helping teams move even faster. Uh, three ways data can break. These are the, the three causes here, data issues, code issues, and then your operational environment issues. Uh, and the last is measurement. I think we're, I often take this for granted. You know, we work in the data space. We we're thinking about data all the time. We're thinking about how to help teams use data. Uh, we should be the first per people to actually use data to measure what we're doing. How do we measure the performance of, of, of the, the systems that we're putting in place, the effort that we're putting into this? Uh, and uh, that to me is uh, really, really exciting. I think there's um, no one better really to take advantage of, of all this data. So that's it. I really appreciate your time. I hope that this was helpful. If it wasn't, please let me know. Uh, I definitely want to hear about it or how, hear how we can make this better. Uh, and of course, if you're curious about uh, learning about Monte Carlo, at our website there, montecarlodata.com. Uh, and I wish you all the best and enjoy the rest of uh, this incredible conference. Thanks so much.